will be in the book of Psalms, chapter number 51 this morning. preach this morning. I, I appreciate that, and I know it's not easy to uh, to hand your pulpit over to someone that you've not heard before, so I do want to thank you for the opportunity to, to preach the word this morning. Um, like I said, we'll be in Psalms chapter number 51, and we'll read just three verses, starting in verse number 10. <clears throat> the psalmist writing here, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy, thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you, Father, that we can go boldly into the throne room. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for the opportunity to be back in church. We pray, God, you be with us as we go throughout the rest of the service. I pray, Lord, you hide me behind the cross and make preaching easy, Lord. And I pray, Father, that... If there's anyone here this morning that's lost, I pray God to show them the condition of their soul. Say them before it's everlasting too late, before they have to spend an eternity in hell. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we uh, as we see here, the, the psalmist, uh, the David, is, he's, he's writing here, and he says in verse number 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart. And and um, I think that that's something that's really important for us as, as Christians, that we need to pray that every day is, Creating me a clean heart. You see, uh, uh, we we get saved, and and we know that when we get saved, God forgives us of our sins. He he washes our sins away. He he cleanses our soul. But we still need that clean heart created in us every day. We can look back and and we can see multiple examples of it. In back in the New and Old Testament, we can see where where Paul, no, he he had been Saul, but where he when uh, when he was persecuting the Christians, that, and then Lord, he, he come by and he, he, Lord gloriously saved him, and then Paul had to change his whole lifestyle over from one who persecuted the Christians to one who, who preached to and uplifted the Christians, and we can look back and we, we can see the, the, the story of Zacchaeus who, 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 was, who had to climb up in the tree just to see Jesus, and then Jesus calls him down and says, I'm, I'm going to your house, I'm going to Go to your house and eat supper with you. We see that right there when Zacchaeus was saved, that what does he do? He has a complete change in his life, and he starts saying, hey, if I've wronged anyone, then not only will I pay them back, I'll pay them back threefold what I've done wrong. Zacchaeus, I believe, prayed that, that God would create in him a new heart. It's not something that, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times there we see young people get saved or uh, a new a new Christian, new convert, they get saved and they say, well, I'll go right back to my old friends and I'll, I'll get them saved. And that's not the way it works a lot of times because they get right back into that, that temptation, that sin's still there, that, that temptation's still there. Um, my papa, my mom's dad, he, he, was, uh, he lived over in McCurry County and he was one of the biggest bootleggers McCurry County had over there at that time. And he was, he was a drunk and he was mean and, 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 boot, and ran whiskey all, all through there, all through the, 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 the 30s and 40s and 50s. I mean, he was a mean man. And, and he was actually drunk the night that the Lord saved him. He was, he was drunk the night that he, he drove by the church and, and heard the preaching and went in. He got saved that night. And Papa had a buddy that he always run whiskey with that, was, that ended up getting saved not long after Papa did. And that man ended up... Papa ended up being a preacher, and that man ended up being a deacon at the church. But at some point, Papa had to pray, Lord, create me a new heart. He had to quit hanging out with that man until that man got saved because he knew that if he didn't, then he'd be brought back into the same old lifestyle that he'd been in just a few months earlier. He had to pray, Lord, create me a new heart. And <clears throat> But the, the problem is, I think a lot of times we have these these sinful habits, we have, we have these, the, the, the habits that we have when we got saved, we say, hey, every time I, I, I eat, I do this, or every time I go here, I do this, and we have to say, Lord, create me a new heart, create me new habits, new, new, new actions, new ways of acting, new ways of dealing with people, new ways of, of speaking, new ways of, uh, of, of uh, new, new, new types of entertainment that I enjoy, whatever it is, we have to say, Lord, create me a new heart because the old man and the old heart was what got me in the shape that I was in that I needed the Lord. I'm afraid a lot of times that we don't say 
create me a new heart. I know it, as far as for me, I know that I'll pray that prayer and I'll say, Lord, create me a new heart. And then it'll go, it'll go a few days or weeks or months or whatever before I've prayed that prayer again. And I can look back and I can see where the old man has started to come back and he started to take that hold of my life. It's not saying that I'm not saved anymore. I'm still saved. I'm eternally saved. But that old man is getting a hold of my life because that new heart isn't being created every day. And, and it isn't being just renewed all the time. <clears throat> we look around and we, and it's a change that we can't make in ourselves. It's a change I can't, I can't change that sinful nature of my own on my own. It's uh, and David we see here, he, uh, David was a great man. The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. We can look and we can, and that said in the New Testament. That said after David. Uh, committed adultery. That said, after David had a man murdered. That's that said, after David's house was considered a house of blood because of all the things that he done. That said, after all that, he was still considered a man after God's own heart. And uh, but we look and we see that that King David, one of the the, the who it is figured as the greatest king that Israel's ever had. He says, creating me a new heart has to be said every single day. The same David who who just as a little kid slew Goliath with just a rock, that same David said, I need God to create in me a new heart. The same David who, who whenever, when, who, who had the battles after battles with Saul and then with Absalom and, with, and battles with the Philistines, that same David who had done these great mighty things who the Lord had won great battles through him, he still said, I need, to, I need the Lord to create in me a new heart. He'd done all these things. He was able to to lead Israel, he's able to slay a giant, he's able to do all these things with the Lord's help, but he could not create the new heart on his own. It had to be a work of the Lord, it had to be something that God done through him, or it wouldn't get done. And we look down here and he says, create a right spirit in me. And the second part of verse number 10 here says, create a right spirit in me. There's a whole lot of spirits in this world. There's a whole lot of, and, and we know that there's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, however you want to say it, we we know that, but that's not what I'm talking about this morning. There's a whole lot of spirits. We have a spirit of jealousy. That's not a right spirit. And uh, and preachers, this is this is one of the things that preachers really struggle with. And I know whenever I was first called as preacher, it was something that I'd struggle with. I'd go and I'd 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 study all week long or whatever, and I'd get up and I'd preach my heart out, and nobody'd come, nobody'd come and make a move. And then another preacher get up and and he'd preach, and somebody'd get saved, and I'd get jealous. I'd say, "Well, Lord, why'd you do that for him? Why'd you do it for me?" Or I'd look around and I'd get jealous because this brother was able to hold a, was being allowed to hold a. a uh, a, a revival, or this brother was being able to, he was preaching this, or whatever, and I was, and, and we get that spirit of jealousy, and as, as churches, we get a spirit of jealousy, we look around, and we say, hey, this, and, and instead of looking, and instead of saying, praise God that somebody got saved, or instead of saying, praise God that they're holding a revival, we get jealous that's not us, and like I said, the same way of, of churches, we hear of someone getting saved at another church, and instead of saying, Praise God, someone gets saved and say, well, why didn't it happen at our church? Why didn't this happen here? Why didn't this happen there? We do it as Christians. Uh, someone comes to us and, and says, hey, will you please pray for me? I've, I've got this job that I'm trying to get. Will you please pray for me? We pray for them. And then they, they get that job and they start making a little bit more money and we get jealous. We say, hey, why ain't that me? We have that spirit of jealousy. That's not that's not a right spirit. We have a spirit of, of a lot of times we have a spirit of, uh, of hatred almost and we look around and we say and I'm not saying that that we should that we should uh, uh, accept or or condone sin sin should be condemned but we we don't show love towards the sinner anymore we look around in your average church your average Christian doesn't love the sinner it doesn't seem they're they're quick to bash them they're quick to hit them over the head if they can but they don't love the sinner they don't show them the love of Jesus Christ they'll they'll come up and they'll say you ain't nothing but an old drunk well, he knows that. He knows he's a drunk. But he doesn't know that Jesus is the key to, to him getting out of those chains of sin that he's in. Let's share Jesus with him. I remember many years ago, I used to work at Lowe's, and, and, and I was a, a, a class deliveryman. We'd you know if you ordered a washer and dryer, we'd, we'd deliver it to you. And the guy that I was on the truck with, I hadn't been saved very long, and he'd been saved a little bit longer than me, and we got, a, got an order to deliver a washer and dryer to a, a very well-known um a homosexual couple there in Corbin to deliver a washer and dryer to their house. Well, we pull up and he's mad about it the whole way. He's mad about it. So I can't believe we did. We, I can't believe we've got to take it to him. 
And so we pull up to their house and, and we start to get out and, and they come out and meet us and we're like, well, yeah, it's going in the basement. I said, okay. So we unbox the washer and dryer in the back of the truck and he says, we'll just sit on the porch. We ain't tell you, I ain't, I ain't going to be sitting going in that house. What will that do to our testimony? That's funny. I said, I said, it'll, it'll destroy our testimony if we sit on the porch. I said, but if somebody sees us taking in there, it'll, our testimony will be, hey, they had a job to do, and they done it, whether they liked it or not. And we went in there, and he was mad the whole time. Stood there with his arms crossed and, and stared up and wouldn't say two words to him. So we get done, and we take the old one out and put it on the truck and tell, have him sign the papers, tell him have a nice day, and go to climb in the truck. And then in each one of the seats, there's a Gatorade bottle with a $20 bill rubber banded to it. And uh, he says, oh, that was pretty nice of him. I said, you ain't, surely you ain't going to drink that. What would that say about your testimony? See, we didn't have the right spirit when we went there. And I'm not saying anything about me. It was just, and, and I'm not saying anything good about me. I tell you the difference between me and those two men we delivered to was the grace of God. I'm no better than them. They are no better worse. They are no worse than me. The only difference is the grace of God. The only difference in you and them is the grace of God. The grace of God allowed you to be brought up in a Christian home. The grace of God allowed you to have Christian influences in your life to allow you to steer you one way as opposed to another way. That's the only difference in us. But I tell you what, he didn't have the right spirit at the time. You see, that's why the Bible he says, create, he says, renew in me the right spirit. You know, we've all when we first get saved, you remember when you first got saved, that spirit where you loved everybody. You'd walk up and, and the person that wronged you for 20 years, you'd walk up and you'd share the gospel with them. You'd walk up and you'd hug them, you'd walk up and shake their hands. That's the right spirit. We all had that when we first got saved. But somewhere along the line, circumstances and life takes that spirit from us. Somewhere along the line, we get so we get so just worn down with the circumstances. We we get we look around. We say, "Oh, this I can't believe it." And we start to have these other spirits come about us, and and we say, "Hey, this this isn't right. It's just it's not the way it should be." But that's just the way it is. Um, I remember many years ago a church that we attended over in, in McCreary County. They uh, they got a young pastor in there, and, and he started following different different people instead of following the word. And the church ended up splitting, and it, it was a horrible thing because there's a real prominent church in that community, and it ended up splitting. And I remember, and there's a there's a lady. She was my Sunday school teacher when I was when I was just this, or probably young when I was probably close to this little kid's age. She was my Sunday school teacher, and if you see her today, what the first thing she wants to talk about is a man that was a pastor there. That was in the mid '90s. That's way long ago. There's there's no sense bringing it up, but she's stuck on it. She can't get past it. And I remember one day I was working in my uncle's gas station, and this man come in. He had he got gas, and he was going to do something there in Corbin. He walked in. He walked up. He said, "Hey, I hope you can forgive me." He said, "I wasn't right in what I done. I hope you can forgive me." See, that man got a new spirit. That that spirit was renewed in him. It wasn't the same old spirit. But I tell you what, some people they they say, "Oh, this person done me wrong. I can never forgive them." That's not the right spirit. That's not the spirit that we need to have in our hearts. No, I mean, <clears throat> we look around and we say, oh, I can't believe that you forgive somebody that done this. I can't believe you forgive somebody that done that. I don't know. I can't believe that Jesus would forgive me, you knowing all the sins that I've committed But after I got saved, not before I got saved, knowing all the times after I got saved that I said, hey, I just don't feel like doing it. I'm just going to throw in the towel and quit. I don't know. I'll tell you what. I just don't feel like doing this. Knowing all the times after I got saved and somebody would stand up and say something and instead of standing up for the word, instead of standing up for the Lord, I would just shirk down and try to sneak away. And he still forgave me of my sins. Amen. Who am I to not forgive someone who may have who may have slighted me or or who may not have, but who I think may have slighted me? Who am I to, to say that or who am I to do that? Amen. We need God to renew that right spirit in us. And you say, what is the right spirit? Well, it's the, we, we look in the, in the New Testament about the fruits of the spirit. Where it says the fruits of the spirit, what are they? They're love. And the fruits of the spirit is forgiveness. That's a right spirit that a Christian has. And I'm not saying that, that you should... Just let, let the world run roughshod over it. I'm not saying that, but I tell you what, whenever someone does something wrong, whenever someone wrongs someone, they shouldn't be afraid to come to you and say, hey, brother, I've done something wrong. They shouldn't be afraid that you're going to chew them out. They shouldn't be afraid that you're going to bite their head off. I seen a thing where this guy, he said, one of two things happens. He says, a religious man, he says, a religious man says, oh, God, I've done wrong. I can't go to God. But a, a saved man says, oh, I've done wrong. I need to go to God. And that's the same kind of spirit we need to have in us. 
And as parents, we need to have that spirit that if our kids come, that if our kids have done wrong, they don't need to say, oh, I can't go to mom and dad. I've done wrong. They need to be able to say, oh, I need to go to mom and dad. I've done wrong. I've messed up. I've got to be able to go to mom and dad. And that's the same kind of spirit that we as a church ha should have. Uh, so many times it seems like that, that churches all across the land have the spirit that if somebody messes up, they say, oh, I can't go to that church. I'm, I, I, I messed up in sin. I, I messed up Thursday night. I can't go to that church. When instead they need to say, I need to go to church. I got myself in sin. I've got myself in a mess. I need to go to church and find help. That's the same spirit that we need to have both as Christians and as the church. We need to have that spirit. Uh, our pastor preached a message one time about how the church should be a hospital. It ain't a museum. It's a hospital. It's a hospital to help people. I've never, I've never seen somebody say, I'll tell you what, I'm so sick, but man, the minute I get to feeling a little bit better, I'll go to that hospital and see what they can do. That, that, that defeats the whole purpose of the hospital. It's the same way with sinners. Sinners shouldn't say, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm living in a mess, and, and once I start, once I string all this out, then I'll try to go to God and get right. No, go to God, and he'll make it right for you. And I'm not saying that as, as Christians and as church members that we can live our life any way we want to. There's still accountability, and accountability has to be had. We have to hold one another accountable, but we shouldn't close the door in somebody's face because they're living in sin, because we've got the very thing that they need. We've got the exact thing that they need right here, and they need to hear the gospel from us. In verse number 12, he says, Restoring to me the joy of my salvation. Restoring to me the joy of my salvation. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 10, or verse 10 actually calls the joy of our salvation is the strength. He says that the, <clears throat> tells us that the, 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 joy of our, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Do you remember the first day or night that you got saved, how happy you were? How tickled you were, you you would have took on anything. You went out and you you wanted to tell everybody about the gospel. You wanted to you wanted to share the gospel with the with the cashier at Walmart. You wanted to share the gospel with the with the guy that pumps your gas at BP. You wanted to share the gospel with anybody and everybody. As you went through McDonald's, you wanted to share the gospel with that with that little guy or guy that handed your food out. That's how the joy of our salvation, how excited we were. I'll tell you what, I remember the night that my wife and I both got saved. I remember the night that my boy the day that my oldest son got saved, and I remember the night that my, my uh, youngest son and my daughter got saved. They got saved on the same night. You see, the, there's a pastor down in, in, down in Canada Town in Wheeler County. He's sick. He's, he's got some serious medical issues, and he wasn't able to hold the pulpit, and he asked us to come and preach. And so we went down there, and we preached a few times. It was the last time I was going to be preaching there. And I got up, and the Lord led me to preach a message on salvation. And, uh, and I preached, and I preached. And then the, the one who got saved that night was my little girl. My little girl came, and she gloriously got saved. And then as we were driving, we, we left there. And we went towards the house. My wife said we should probably go to the church and let her tell Brother Randy, who's our pastor, let her tell him about getting saved. And we started driving up I-75 to go to the church. And my, my youngest boy says, Dad, what if I ain't saved? And I can't pull over because we're driving up I-75. There's trucks passing us today, my on air. But on the way there, as we were driving up I-75, Jacob asked the Lord to save him, and he got saved. Glorious was saved. You said, what is that? I'll tell you what I think it is. Here's what I think it is. I think the Lord had the Lord wanted to save those two so much that he moved in a great and mighty way that he said, hey, they're, they're, for some reason, they're not going to be able to get it right here. I'm going to have to allow this man to preach right here. This is where the Spirit's moving. This is where they're going to feel more comfortable, whatever. And so maybe that preacher got sick just so my kids can get saved. You say, I don't believe that. i tell you what I do. I believe that God thinks that highly of us. I believe he thinks that highly of you, ma'am, and you, sir, that he'll do whatever he has to to get you saved, whatever he has to, to where you're in a spot where you can get saved. And that's the joy that we need to have. That's the joy of our salvation. Uh, look back and we look around and we say, man, I'm so depressed. I'm so down. This is going on. That's going on. This is going on in our state, in our county, in our country. That's going on. We, we focus so much on that and we forget about looking about the joy of our salvation. So, and the Bible doesn't say that he took the salvation away. Satan can't take my salvation away. Satan did nothing to get my salvation. He's not involved in my salvation in any bit, none whatsoever. I tell you, I can't give my salvation away. The only person who had the power of my salvation was the Lord Jesus Christ when he died on Calvary. I can't lose my, my salvation because I did nothing to earn my salvation. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ did my salvation. It was a free gift that I accepted. But I tell you what, so Satan can't take my salvation. 
situation, but he can sure take the joy of it, and he can take the strength that every Christian has. We look around and we say, why are so many people, why are so many people getting out of church? They're falling out left and right and back and forth. They're falling out of church. Why are they doing so? Because they've not got the joy in their salvation. And you say, why are they, why are they losing it? I don't know why they're losing it. I really don't know. I don't know if it's the fact that we, we don't look around and we don't realize what position we were in when we got saved. I don't know if it's because we don't look around and we don't realize just how close we were to dying and going to hell and we were one breath away from dying and going to hell and spending eternity in the devil's hell. We were that close to it. I don't know if it's because we don't look around and don't realize that it was only by the grace of God that we're in here this morning instead of laid up somewhere with a hangover, instead of laid up in a jail cell somewhere. I don't know why it is, but for some reason we, and I'm saying we because I'm included, I'm including myself because there's sometimes I get to focusing on this, I'll get to focusing on, on the, the stress of, of work or everyday life or whatever, and I get to looking around and I'll forget about the joy of my salvation. You see, my wife, she's a huge UK basketball fan, the biggest UK fan I've probably ever met. And that's saying something because she, she probably didn't even know Kentucky basketball existed until about 2010 or so. She grew up in Ohio, but she's a huge UK fan. She's such a big UK fan that there for a little while, it was almost as if the, the, the mood of her was determined by the outcome of the game. And we laugh because it's the same way with all of us. How many people have we looked around and we've done it. I work with some Tennessee fans. And I tell you what, if Tennessee gets beat on Saturday, you better believe I'm going to give them grief next time I see them. We do that. We, and they do the exact same thing to me. You better believe if Kentucky gets beat, you better believe that when Evansville, Evansville beat Kentucky this year, as soon as I went to work the next day, there's plenty of people there to tell me about it. Plenty of people there to ask me if I'd seen the game. You say, what are you talking about? You see, we get joy out of that. We get joy. I got joy when Kentucky won the championship in 2012. I got joy as when I was younger when they won it in 96 and 98, but I didn't get squat out of it. I may have a t-shirt at the house that says UK National Championships, but I didn't get squat out of it. I ain't got a ring out of it. It didn't, it didn't affect my life none whatsoever. It made me happy for a day or two or maybe even a week, but that's all it is. That's all it, that's the only difference it made in my life, but we get so much joy out of that. Why can't we get that? joy out of our salvation, which has an eternal difference, which has made an eternal difference in our lives. Why don't we get that same joy out of the fact that whenever somebody comes around and says, hey, brother, do you remember the night you got saved? Hey, brother, do you remember the day the Lord Jesus come by and he said, hey, you're lost. You're dying. You're on your way to hell. You're going to go to hell, but I've come to, I went to Calvary just to save you, and I'm coming by your heart right now of all the people in the world, all the people in the world that there is, there's people there, there's people that are much more important than me that he could have spent his time saving. There's people that are much more important than me. There are people much smarter than me, much richer than me, much more important in this whole world than me that he could have went to and no one would have blamed him. But he come to me and gave me a second, and third, and fourth, and fifth opportunity to get saved. He done the exact same thing for you. At least we think about that and we look around and we say, hey, I was nothing but an old sinner, nothing but an old dog, not worth shooting, but the Lord still come by and he gloriously saved me. I think if we think about that, then we'll renew that strength of our, then, <clears throat> then the, the, the strength of our, the joy of our salvation will be restored. It says, uphold me with thy free spirit. How does that, how does that happen? Well, that happens when that joy of our salvation is renewed, then we're upheld. The Lord upholds us in that free spirit. We look around and we say, we say, preacher, there's so much going on in this world. We say, preacher, there's, there's so much going on in my family, so much going on in my life right now, and I get that. I really do. We've got things going on in our family too. I mean, there's we've got family members who are sick. We've got we've got family members who are lost, and I completely understand all that. <clears throat> but the thing that we need to focus on is getting the, the joy of our salvation restored. And how do we do that? Do what David here done. David says, "Create me a new heart and restore to me the joy of my salvation." He didn't go to he didn't go to Jonathan, who was his friend, he didn't go to him and do it. He asked him to do it. He didn't go to, to his wife and ask her to restore to me the joy of my salvation. He didn't, he didn't go to one of the kings, one of his advisors that he's had and, and said, create me a, a clean heart, a new heart. He didn't do none of that. He went to the Lord. 
and we say, how do you know the Lord will do it? How do you know the Lord will, how do you, how do you know the Lord will accept me? You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done this week. I've, I've messed up. I've made a mess of it. I've made a gummed up mess of all of everything. I've, I've, I, I, I've, I've messed up my testimony. I've messed up this, that, and the other. Well, <clears throat> I know because I know that the story of the prodigal son was given for someone like me. The story of the prodigal son was written in the Gospels for someone like you, for someone like all of us, to say, hey, as we, as we read that story, we see that the prodigal son, he made a mess of it, and a gummed up mess, and, and the word had got back to his dad about the mess he'd made, and, and it had to have hurt his dad whenever he heard what his son had done, because that wasn't the way that he taught his son, that wasn't the the, uh, that wasn't how he raised his son up, but he heard what he was doing, and, and then the son come back, and the dad, he didn't go out and give him a whooping. He didn't go out and scold him. He went out to hug his neck and said, hey, get that fatted calf, that one that we've been preparing since the day he left, the one that we've, we've put aside just for this occasion. He said, God's got that. He's got it prepared for you. He's got it pre prepared for us. I'm not saying that gives us a... a a license to go out and live however we want to and then come back because there are there are scars that are that that, that Christians carry because of the time that they spend out in the world and, and there are there are damages to our testimony that 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 we may never be able to repay but that we may never be able to rebuild it up. But I tell you what, he's standing there waiting, he's saying, Come to me. I'll restore that joy to you. you just come on, all you gotta do, got do is be willing to come into me and I'll restore that joy to you. All he's saying is, hey, come on, come on, I'll, I'll create that new heart in you. That's going to be every day. Come on, I want to come and get a song of invitation, please.